chapter one of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter one fisherman davy of fish out of water i am but an ancient fisherman upon the coasts of glamorganshire with work enough of my own to do and trouble enough of my own to heed in getting my poor living yet no peace there is for me among my friends and neighbours unless i will set to and try as they bid me twice a day perhaps whether i cannot tell the rights of a curious adventure which it pleased providence should happen off and on amidst us now for a good many years and with many ins and outs to it they assure me also that all good people who can read and write for ten or it may be twenty miles around the place i live in will buy my book if i can make it at a higher price perhaps per pound than they would give me even for suin which are the very best fish i catch and hence provision may be found for the old age and infirmities now gaining upon me every time i try to go out fishing in this encouragement and prospect i have little faith knowing how much more people care about what they eat than what they read nevertheless i will hope for the best especially as my evenings now are very long and wearisome and i was counted a hopeful scholar fifty years agone perhaps in our village school here not to mention the royal navy and most of all because a very wealthy gentleman whose name will appear in this story has promised to pay all expenses and fifty pounds down if i do it well and to leave me the profit if any notwithstanding this the work of writing must be very dull to me after all the change of scene and the open air and sea and the many sprees ashore and the noble fights with frenchmen and the power of oaths that made me jump so in his majesty's navy god save the king and queen and members of the royal family be they as many as they will and they seem in faith to be manifold but his power is equal to it all and they will but try to meet him however not to enter upon any views of politics all of which are far beyond the cleverest hand at a bait among us i am inditing of a thing very plain and simple when you come to understand it yet containing a little strangeness and some wonder here and there and apt to move good people's grief at the wrongs we do one another great part of it fell under mine own eyes for a period of a score of years or something thereabout my memory still is pretty good but if i contradict myself or seem to sweep beyond my reach or in any way to meddle with things which i had better have let alone as a humble man and a christian i pray you to lay the main fault thereof on the badness of the times and the rest upon human nature for i have been a roving man and may have gathered much of evil from contact with my fellow-men although by origin meant for good in this i take some blame to myself for if i had polished my virtue well the evil could not have stuck to it nevertheless i am on the whole pretty well satisfied with myself hoping to be of such quality as the lord prefers to those perfect creatures with whom he has no trouble at all and therefore no enjoyment but sometimes taking up a book i am pestered with a troop of doubts not only about my want of skill and language and experience but chiefly because i never have been a man of consummate innocence excellence and high wisdom such as all these writers are if we go by their own opinions now when i plead among my neighbours at the mouth of the old well all the above my sad shortcomings and my own strong sense of them which perhaps is somewhat overstrong they only pat me on the back and smile at one another and make a sort of coughing noise according to my bashfulness and then if i look pleased which for my life i cannot help doing they wink as it were at one another and speak up like this now davy you know better you think yourself at least as good as any one of us davy and likely far above us all 
therefore davy the fisherman out with all you have to say without any french palaver you have a way of telling things so that we can see them with this and with that and most of all with hinting about a frenchman they put me on my mettle so that i sit upon the side stones of the old well gallery which are something like the companion rail of a fore and after and gather them around me with the householders put foremost according to their income and the children listening between their legs and thus i begin but never end the tale i now begin to you and perhaps shall never end it end of chapter one chapter two of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter two hunger drives him a fishing in the summer of the year seventeen eighty two i david llewellyn of newton nottage fisherman and old sailor was in great distress and trouble more than i like to tell you my dear wife a faithful partner for eight and twenty years in spite of a very quick temper was lately gone to a better world and i missed her tongue and her sharp lookout at almost every corner also my son as fine a seaman as ever went aloft after helping lord rodney to his great victory over gras the frenchman had been lost in a prize ship called the tunner of fifty-four guns and five hundred crapos which sank with all hands on her way home to spithead under admiral graves his young wife who had been sent to us to see to with his blessing no sooner heard of this sad affair as in the gazette reported and his pay that week stopped on her but she fell into untimely travail and was dead ere morning so i buried my wife and daughter-in-law and lost all chance to bury my son between two bridge and market days now this is not very much of course compared with the troubles some people have but i had not been used to this matter except in case of a messmate and so i was greatly broken down and found my eyes so weak of a morning that i would not be seen out of doors almost the only one now to keep a stir or sound of life in my little cottage which faces to the churchyard was my orphan grandchild bunny daughter of my son just drowned and his only child that we knew of bunny was a rare strong lass five years old about then i think a stout and hearty feeding child able to chew every bit of her victuals and mounting a fine rosy colour and eyes as black as archangel pitch one day when i was moping there all abroad about my bearings and no better than water ballasted the while i looked at my wife's new broom now carrying cobweb try sails this little bunny came up to me as if she had a boarding pike and sprang into the netting hammocks of the best black coat i wore granda she said and looked to know in what way i would look at her granda i must have something more to eat something more to eat i cried almost with some astonishment well as i knew her appetite for the child had eaten a barley loaf and two pig's feet and a dog-fish yes more more bexfess granda and though she had not the words to tell she put her hands in a way that showed me she ought to have more solid food i could not help looking sadly at her proud as i was of her appetite but recovering in a minute or two i put a good face upon it my dear and you shall have more i said only take your feet out of my pocket little heart have i for fishing god knows but a fishing i will go this day if mother jones will see to you 
for i could not leave her alone quite yet although she was a brave little maid and no fire now was burning but within a child's trot from my door and down toward the sand-hills was that famous ancient well of which i spoke just now dedicate to st john the baptist where they used to scourge themselves the village church stood here they say before the inroad of the sand and the water was counted holy how that may be i do not know but the well is very handy it has a little grey round tower of stone domed over the heart of it to which a covered way goes down with shallow steps irregular if it were not for this plan the sand would whelm the whole of it over even as it has overwhelmed all the departure of the spring and the cottages once surrounding it down these steps the children go each with a little brown pitcher holding hands and groping at the sides as they begin to feel darker and what with the sand beneath their feet and the narrowing of the roof above and the shadows moving round them and the doubt where the water begins or ends which nobody knows at any time it is much but what some little maid tumbles in and the rest have to pull her out again for this well has puzzled all the country and all the men of great learning being as full of contrariety as a maiden courted it comes and goes in a manner against the coming and going of the sea which is only half a mile from it and twice in a day it is many feet deep and again not as many inches and the water is so crystal clear that down in the dark it is like a dream some people say that john the baptist had nothing to do with the making of it because it was made before his time by the ancient family of de sanford who once owned all the manors here in this however i place no faith having read my bible to better purpose than to believe that john baptist was the sort of man to claim anything least of all any water unless he came honestly by it in either case it is very pretty to see the children round the entrance on a summer afternoon when they are sent for water they are all a little afraid of it partly because of its maker's name and his having his head on a charger and partly on account of its curious ways and the sand coming out of its nostrils when first it begins to flow that day with which i begin my story mrs jones was good enough to take charge of little bunny and after getting ready to start i set the thong of our latch inside so that none but neighbours who knew the trick could enter our little cottage or rather mine i should say now and thus with conger rod and prawn net and a long pole of the bass and a junk of pressed tobacco and a lump of barley bread and a maybird stuffed with onions just to refine the fishiness away i set for a long shore day upon as dainty a summer morn as ever shone out of the heavens fisherman davy as they call me all around our parts was fifty and two years of age i believe that very same july and with all my heart i wish that he were as young this very day for i never have found such call to enter into the affairs of another world as to forget my business here or press upon providence impatiently for a more heavenly state of things people may call me worldly-minded for cherishing such a view of this earth and perhaps it is not right of me however i can put up with it and be in no unkindly haste to say good-bye to my neighbours for to my mind such a state of seeking as many amongst us do even boast of is unless in a bad cough or a perilous calenture a certain proof of curiosity displeasing to our maker and i might even say of fickleness degrading to a true briton the sun came down upon my head so that i thought of bygone days when i served under captain howe or sir edward hawke and used to stroll away upon leave with half a hundred jacks ashore at naples or in bermudas or wherever the luck might happen 
now however was no time for me to think of strolling because i could no longer live at the expense of the government which is the highest luck of all and full of noble dignity things were come to such a push that i must either work or starve and could i but recall the past i would stroll less in the days gone by a pension of one and eightpence farthing for the weeks i was alive being in right of a heavy wound in capture of the bellona frenchman of two and thirty guns by his majesty's frigate vesta under captain hood was all i had to hold on by in support of myself and bunny except the slippery fish that come and go as providence orders them she had sailed from martinique when luckily we fell in with her and i never shall forget the fun and the five hours at close quarters we could see the powder on the other fellows faces while they were training their guns at us and we showed them with a slap our noses which they never contrived to hit she carried heavier metal than ours and had sixty more men to work it and therefore we were obliged at last to capture her by boarding i like a fool was the first that leaped into her mizzen chains without looking before me as ought to have been the frenchman came too fast upon me and gave me more than i bargained for thus it happened that i fell off in the very prime of life and strength from an able-bodied seaman and captain of the foretop to a sort of lurcher along shore and a man who must get his own living with nets and rods and such like for that very beautiful fight took place in the year seventeen fifty nine before i was thirty years old and before his present most gracious majesty came to the throne of england and inasmuch as a villainous frenchman made at me with a cutlash and a power of blue oaths taking a nasty advantage of me while i was yet entangled and thumped in three of my ribs before a kind providence enabled me to relieve him of his head at a blow i was discharged when we came to spithead with an excellent character in a silk bag and a considerable tightness of breathing and leave to beg my way home again now i had not the smallest meaning to enter into any of these particulars about myself especially as my story must be all about other people beautiful maidens and fine young men and several of the prime gentry but as i have written it so let it stay because perhaps after all it is well that people should have some little knowledge of the man they have to deal with and learn that his character and position are a long way above all attempt at deceit to come back once again if you please to that very hot day of july seventeen eighty two whence i mean to depart no more until i have fully done with it both from the state of the moon i knew and from the neap when my wife went off that the top of the spring was likely to be in the dusk of that same evening at first i had thought of going down straight below us to newton bay and peddling over the black rocks towards the ogmore river some two miles to the east of us but the bright sun gave me more enterprise and remembering how the tide would ebb also how low my pocket was i felt myself bound in honour to bunny to make a real push for it and thoroughly searched the conger holes and the lobster ledges which are the best on all our coast round about pool tavan and down below the old house at scar end of chapter two chapter three of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter three the fish are as hungry as he is to fish at scar had always been a matter of some risk and conflict inasmuch as evan thomas who lived in the ancient house there and kept the rabbit warren never could be brought to know that the sea did not belong to him 
he had a grant from the manor he said and the shore was part of the manor and whosoever came hankering there was a poacher a thief and a robber with these hard words and harder blows he kept off most of the neighbourhood but i always felt that the lurch of the tide was no more than the healing of a ship and therefore that any one free of the sea was free of the ebb and flow of it so when he began to reproach me once i allowed him to swear himself thoroughly out and then in a steadfast manner said black evan the shore is not mine or yours stand you here and keep it and i will never come again for in three hours time there would be a fathom of water where we stood and when he caught me again i answered evan black if you catch me inland meddling with any of your land goods conies or hares or partridges give me a leathering like a man and i must put up with it but dare you touch me on this shore which belongs to our lord the king all the way under high water mark and by the rod of the red sea i will show you the law of it he looked at me and the pole i bore and heavy and strong man as he was he thought it wiser to speak me fair well well do you dear he said in welsh having scarce any english you have served the king do you and are bound to know what is right and wrong only let me know good man if you see any other rogues fishing here this i promised him freely enough because of course i had no objection to his forbidding other people and especially one vile scotchman yet being a man of no liberality he never could see even me fish there without following and abusing me and most of all after market day that tide i had the rarest sport that ever you did see scarcely a conger hole i tried without the landlord being at home and biting savagely at the iron which came like a rate upon him whereupon i had him by the jaw as the tax-collector has us scarcely a lobster shelf i felt tickling as i do under the weeds but what a grand old soldier came to the portcullis of his stronghold and nabbed the neat hide of my fingers and stuck thereto uh, till i hauled him out nolus wolus as we say and there he showed his purple nippers and his great long whiskers and then his sides hooped like a cask till his knuckle legs fought with the air and the lobes of his tail were quivering it was fine to see these fellows worth at least a shilling and to pop them into my basket where they clawed at one another glorious luck i had in truth and began to forget my troubles and the long way home again to a lonely cottage and my fear that little bunny was passing a sorry day of it she should have a new pair of boots and mother jones a good sunday dinner and as for myself i would think perhaps about half a glass of fine old rum to remind me of the navy and a pipe of the short-cut bristol tobacco but that must depend upon circumstances now circumstances had so much manners contrary to their custom that they contrived to keep themselves continually in my favour not only did i fetch up and pile a noble heap of oysters and mussels just at the lowest of the ebb but after that when the tide was flowing and my work grew brisker as it took me by the calves and my feet were not cut by the mussels more than i could walk upon suddenly i found a thing beating all experience both of the past and future this was that the heat of the weather and the soft south wind prevailing had filled the deep salt water pools among the rocks of pool tavan and as far as fafinan when with the finest prawns ever seen or dreamed of and also had peopled the shallow pools higher up the beach 
with shoals of silver mullet fry small indeed and as quick as lightning but well worth a little trouble to catch being as fine eating as any lady in the land could long for and here for a moment i stood in some doubt whether first to be down on the prawns or the mullet but soon i remembered the tide would come first into the pools that held the prawns now it did not take me very long to fill a great holland bag with these noble fellows rustling their whiskers and rasping their long saws at one another four gallons i found and a little over when i came to measure them and sixteen shillings i made of them besides a good many which bunny ate raw neither was my luck over yet for being now in great heart and good feather what did i do but fall very briskly upon the grey mullet in the pools and fast as they scoured away down the shallows fluting the surface with lines of light and huddling the ripples all up in a curve as they swung themselves round on their tails with a sweep when they could swim no further nevertheless it was all in vain for i blocked them in with a mole of kelp weighted with heavy pebbles and then bailed them out at my pleasure now the afternoon was wearing away and the flood making strongly up the channel by the time i came back from finan when whither the mullet had led me to my headquarters opposite scar farmhouse at the basin of pool tavan this pool is made by a ring of rocks sloping inward from the sea and is dry altogether for two hours ebb and two hours flow of a good spring tide except so much as a little land spring sliding down the slippery seaweed may have power to keep it moist a wonderful place here is for wild fowl the very choicest of all i know both when the sluice of the tide runs out and when it comes swelling back again for as the water ebbs away with a sulky wash in the hollow places and the sand runs down in little crannies and the bladder weeds hang trickling and the limpets close their valves and the beautiful jelly flowers look no better than chilblains all this void and glistening basin is at once alive with birds first the sea-pie runs and chatters and the turnstone pries about with his head laid sideways in a most sagacious manner and the sanderlings glide in file and the green shanks separately then the shy curlews over the point warily come and leave one to watch while the brave little mallard teal with his green triangles glistening stands on one foot in the fresh-water runnel and shakes with his quacks of enjoyment again at the freshening of the flood when the round pool fills with sea pouring in through the gate of rock and the waves push merrily onward then a mighty stir arises and a different race of birds those which love a swimming dinner swoop upon pool tavan here is the giant grey gull breasting like a cherub in church before he douses down his head and here the elegant kitty wake and the sullen cormorant in the shadow swimming and the swiftest of swift wings the silver grey sea swallow dips like a butterfly and is gone while from slumber out at sea or on the pool of ken fig in a long wedge cleaves the air the whistling flight of wild ducks standing upright for a moment with their red toes on the water and their strong wings flapping in they souse with one accord and a strenuous delight then ensues a mighty quacking of unanimous content a courteous nodding of quick heads and a sluicing and a shoveling of water over shoulder-blades and in all the glorious revelry of insatiable washing recovering thence they dress themselves in a sober-minded manner paddling very quietly proudly puffing out their breasts arching their necks and preening themselves titivating as we call it with their bills in and out the down 
and shoulders up to run the wet off then turning their heads as if on a swivel they fettle their backs and their scapular plume then being as clean as clean can be they begin to think of their dinners and with stretched necks down they dive to catch such luscious morsels and all you can see is a little sharp tail and a pair of red feet kicking bless all their innocent souls how often i long to have a good shot at them and might have killed eight or ten at a time with a long gun heavily loaded but all these birds knew as well as i did that i had no gun with me and although they kept at a tidy distance yet they let me look at them which i did with great peace of mind all the time i was eating my supper the day had been too busy till now to stop for any feeding but now there would be twenty minutes or so ere the bass came into pool tavan for these like a depth of water so after consuming my bread and maybird and having a good drink from the spring i happened to look at my great flag basket now ready to burst with conjures and lobsters and mullet and spider crabs for bunny who could manage any quantity also with other good saleable fish and i could not help saying to myself come after all now davy llewellyn you are not gone so far as to want a low scotchman to show you the place where the fish live and with that i lit a pipe what with the hard work and the heat and the gentle splash of wavelets and the calmness of the sunset and the power of red onions what did i do but fall asleep as snugly as if i had been on watch in one of his majesty's ships of the line after a heavy gale of wind and when i woke up again behold the shadows of the rocks were over me and the sea was saluting the calves of my legs which up to that mark were naked and but for my instinct in putting my basket up on a rock behind me all my noble catch of fish must have gone to the locker of davy jones at this my conscience smote me hard as if i were getting old too soon and with one or two of the short strong words which i had learned in the navy where the chaplain himself stirred us up with them up i roused and rigged my pole for a good bout at the bass at the butt of the ash was a bar of square oak figged in with a screw-bolt and roven round this was my line of good hemp twisted evenly so that if any fish came who could master me and pull me off the rocks almost i could indulge him with some slack by unreaving a fathom of line at the end of the pole was a strong loop knot through which ran the line bearing two large hooks with the eyes of their shanks lashed tightly with cobbler's ends upon whipcord the points of the hooks were fetched up with a file and the barbs well backened and the whole dressed over with whale oil then upon one hook i fixed a soft crab and on the other a cuddle fish there were lugworms also in my pot but they would do better after dark when a tumbling cod might be on the feed good luck and bad luck has been my lot ever since i can remember sometimes a long spell of one wing and wing as you might say and then a long leg of the other but never in all my born days did i have such a spell of luck in the fishing way as on that blessed tenth of july seventeen eighty two what to do with it all now became a puzzle for i could not carry it home all at once and as to leaving a bit behind or refusing to catch a single fish that wanted to be caught neither of these was a possible thing to a true-born fisherman at last things came to such a pitch that it was difficult not to believe that all must be the crowd and motion of a very pleasant dream here was the magic ring of the pool shaped by a dance of sea fairies and the fading light shed doubtfully upon the haze of the quivering sea and the silver water lifting like a mirror on a hinge while the black rock seemed to nod to it and here was i pulling out big fishes almost faster than i cast in End of chapter three
chapter four of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter four he lands an unexpected fish now as the rising sea came sliding over the coronet of rocks as well as through the main entrance for even the brim of the pool is covered at high water i beheld a glorious sight stored in my remembrance of the southern regions but not often seen at home the day had been very hot and brilliant with a light air from the south and at sunset a haze arose and hung as if it were an awning over the tranquil sea first a gauze of golden colour as the western light came through and then a tissue shot with red and now a veil of silvery softness as the summer moon grew bright then the quiet waves began as their plaided lines rolled onward into frills of whiteness in the very curl and fall to glisten with a flitting light presently as each puny breaker overshone the one in front not the crest and comb alone but the slope behind it and the crossing flaws in shore gleamed with hovering radiance and soft flashes vanishing till in the deepening of the dusk each advancing crest was sparkling with a mane of fire every breaking wavelet glittered like a shaken seam of gold thence the shower of beads and lustres lapsed into a sliding tear moving up the sands with light or among the pebbles breaking into a cataract of gems being an ancient salt of course i was not dismayed by this show of phosphorus nor even much astonished but rather pleased to watch the brightness as it brought back to my mind thoughts of beautiful sunburnt damsels whom i had led along the shore of the lovely mediterranean yet our stupid landsmen far and wide were panic struck and hundreds fell upon their knees expecting the last trump to sound all i said to myself was this no wonder had i had such sport to-day change of weather soon i doubt and perhaps a thunderstorm as i gazed at all this beauty trying not to go astray with wonder and with weariness there in the gateway of black rock with the offing dark behind her and the glittering waves upon their golden shoulders bearing her sudden as an apparition came a smoothly gliding boat beaded all athwart the bows and down the bends with drops of light holding stem well up in air and the forefoot shedding gold she came as straight toward this poor and unconverted davy as if an angel held the tiller with an admiral in the stern sheets hereupon such terror seized me after the wonders of the day that my pole fell downright into the water of which a big fish wronged me so as to slip the hook and be off again and it was no more than the turn of a hare but what i had run away head over heels for the day had been so miraculous beginning with starvation and going on with so much heat and hard work and enjoyment and such a draught of fishes that a poor body's wits were gone with it and therefore i doubt not it must have been an especial decree of providence that in turning round to run away i saw my big fish basket 
to carry this over the rocks at a run was entirely impossible although i was still pretty good in my legs but to run away without it was a great deal more impossible for a man who had caught the fish himself and beside the fish in the basket there must have been more than two hundred weight of bass that would not go into it three hundred and a half in all was what i set it down at taking no heed of prawns and lobsters and with any luck in selling it must turn two guineas hence perhaps it came to pass as much as from downright bravery of which sometimes i have some little that i felt myself bound to creep back again under the shade of a cold wet rock just to know what that boat was up to a finer floatage i never saw and her lines were purely elegant and she rode above the water without so much as parting it then in spite of all my fear i could not help admiring and it struck me hotly at the heart oh if she is but a real boat what a craft for my business and with that i dropped all fear for i had not been able for many years to carry on my fishing as skill and knowledge warranted only because i could not afford to buy a genuine boat of my own and hitherto had never won the chance without the money as yet i could see no soul on board no one was rowing that was certain neither any sign of a sail to give her steerage way however she kept her course so true that surely there must be some hand invisible at the tiller this conclusion flurried me again very undesirably and i set my right foot in such a manner as to be off in a twinkling of anything unholy but god has care of the little souls which nobody else takes heed of and so he ordained that the boat should heel and then yaw across the middle of the pool but for which black rocks alone would have been her welcome at once my heart came back to me for i saw at once as an old sailor pretty well up in shipwrecks that the boat was no more than a derelict and feeling that here was my chance of chances worth perhaps ten times my catch of fish i set myself in earnest to the catching of that boat therefore i took up my pole again and finding that the brace of fish whom i had been over scared to land had got away during my slackness i spread the hooks and cast them both with the slugs of lead upon them and half a fathom of spare line ready as far as ever my arms would throw the flight of the hooks was beyond my sight for the phosphorus spread confusion but i heard most clearly the thump thump of the two leaden bobs the heavy and the light one upon hollow planking upon this i struck as i would at a fish and the hooks got hold or at any rate one of them and i felt the light boat following faster as she began to get away on the haul and so i drew her gently toward me being still in some misgiving although resolved to go through with it but bless my heart when the light boat glided buoyantly up to my very feet and the moon shone over the starboard gunwale and without much drawback i gazed at it behold the little craft was laden with a freight of pure innocence all for captain crew and cargo was a little helpless child in the stern sheets fast asleep with the baby face towards me lay a little child in white something told me that it was not dead or even ailing 
only adrift upon the world and not at all aware of it quite an atom of a thing taking god's will anyhow cast no doubt according to the rocking of the boat only with one tiny arm put up to keep the sun away before it fell asleep being taken quite aback with pity sorrow and some anger which must have been of instinct i laid hold of the bows of the skiff and drew her up a narrow channel where the land spring found its way the lift of a round wave helped her on and the bladder weed saved any chafing a brand new painter by the feel it was that i caught hold of but instead of a hitch at the end it had a clean sharp cut across it having made it fast with my fishing-pole jammed hard into a crevice of rock i stepped on board rather gingerly and seating myself on the forward thwart gazed from a respectful distance at the little stranger the light of the moon was clear and strong and the phosphorus of the sea less dazing as the night grew deeper therefore i could see pretty well and i took a fresh plug of tobacco before any further meddling for the child was fast asleep and according to my experience they are always best in that way end of chapter four chapter five of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter five a little orphan mermaid by the clear moonlight i saw a very wee maiden all in white having neither cloak nor shawl nor any other soft appliance to protect or comfort her but lying with her little back upon the aftmost planking with one arm bent as i said before and the other drooping at her side as if the baby hand had been at work to ease her crying and then when tears were tired out had dropped in sleep or numb despair my feelings were so moved by this as i became quite sure at last that here was a little mortal that the tears came to mine own eyes too she looked so purely pitiful the lord in heaven have mercy on the little dear i cried without another thought about it and then i went and sat close by so that she lay between my feet however she would not awake in spite of my whistling gradually and singing a little song to her and playing with her curls of hair therefore as nothing can last for ever and the tide was rising fast i was forced to give the little lady not what you would call a kick so much as a very gentle movement of the muscles of the foot she opened her eyes at this and yawned but was much inclined to shut them again till i having to get home that night could make no further allowance for her as having no home to go to and upon this i got over all misgivings about the dirtiness of my jacket and did what i had feared to do by reason of great respect for her that is to say i put both hands very carefully under her and lifted her like a delicate fish and set her crosswise on my lap and felt as if i understood her and she could not have weighed more than twenty pounds according to my heft of fish having been touched with trouble lately i was drawn out of all experience now for my nature is not over soft towards this little thing so 
cast in a dream almost upon me i thought of her mother well drowned no doubt and the father who must have petted her and of the many times to come when none would care to comfort her and though a child is but a child somehow i took to that child therefore i became most anxious as to her state of body and handled her little mites of feet and her fingers and all her outworks because i was not sure at all that the manner of her yawning might be nothing more or less than a going out of this world almost for think if you can see it so how everything was against her to be adrift without any food or any one to tend her many hours or days perhaps with a red-hot sun or cold stars overhead and the greedy sea beneath her however there she was alive and warm and limp to the best of my judgment sad though i was to confess to myself that i knew more of bass than of babies for it had always so pleased god that i happened to be away at sea when he thought fit to send them therefore my legs went abroad with fear of dandling this one that now was come in a way to disgrace a seaman for if she should happen to get into irons i never could get her out again upon that matter at any rate i need not have concerned myself for the child was so trim and well ballasted also ribbed so stiff and sound that any tack i set her on she would stick to it and start no rope and knowing that this was not altogether the manner of usual babies who yaw about and no steerage way i felt encouraged and capable almost of a woman's business therefore i gave her a little tickle and verily she began to laugh or perhaps i should say by rights to smile in a gentle and superior way for she always was superior and a funnier creature never lived neither one that could cry so distressfully wake up wake up my dearie said i and don't you be afraid of me a fine little girl i've got at home about twice the size that you be and goes by the name of bunny bunny she said and i was surprised not being up to her qualities that she could speak so clearly then it struck me that if she could talk like that i might as well know more about her so i began very craftily with the thing all children are proud about and are generally sure to be up to pretty little soul i said how old do you call yourself at this she gathered up her forehead not being used to the way i put it while she was trying to think it out how old are you dearie said i trying hard to suck up my lips and chirp as i had seen the nurses do eyes too eyes too she answered looking with some astonishment didn't na know that hot's a name this proof of her high standing and knowledge of the world took me for the moment a good deal off my legs until i remembered seeing it put as a thing all must give into that the rising generation was beyond our understanding so i answered very humbly dearie my name is old davy baby kiss old davy i ill she answered briskly old davy i like sa i'll be a good gal i ill a good girl to be sure you will bless my heart i never saw such a girl and i kissed her three or four times over until she began to smell my plug and bunny was nobody in my eyes but 
what's your own name dearie now you know old davy's name i's barty didn't a know that to be sure i did for a little fib was needful from the way she looked at me and the biggest one ever told would have been a charity under the circumstances peas old daisy eyes i hungy she went on ere i was right again and i ants to dink a yodder what a fool i am cried i of course you do you darling what an atomy you are to talk stop here a moment setting her on the seat by herself like a stupid as i was for she might have tumbled overboard i jumped out of the boat to fetch her water from the spring-head as well as the relics of my food from the corner of the fish-basket and truly vexed was i with myself for devouring of my dinner so but no sooner was i gone than feeling so left alone again after so much desertion what did the little thing do but spring like a perfect grasshopper and slipping under the after thwart set off in the bravest toddle for the very bow of the boat in fear of losing sight of me unluckily the boat just happened to lift upon a bit of a wave and not having won her sea-legs yet in spite of that long cruise down came poor bardie with a thump which hurt me more than her i think knowing what bunny would have done i expected a fearful roar and back i ran to lift her up but even before i could interfere she was up again and all alive with both her arms stretched out to show and her face set hard to defy herself i ont ki i ont i tell a e see if i does now am ma say hot a good gal i is where did you knock yourself little wonder let old davy make it well show old davy the poor sore place ne'er it is guardy la ne'er poor bardy knock herself and she held up her short white smock and showed me the bend of her delicate round knee as simply and kindly as could be i ont ki no i ont she went on with her pretty lips screwed up little brother ki e no but bardy a gate big gal savvy voo bardy too big enough to ki however all this greatness vanished when a drop of blood came oozing from the long black bruise and still more when i tried to express my deep compassion the sense of bad luck was too strong for the courage of even two years growth and little bardie proved herself of just the right age for crying i had observed how clear and bright and musical her voice was for such a tiny creature and now the sound of her great woe and scene of her poor helpless plight was enough to move the rocks into a sense of pity for her however while she had her cry out as the tide would never wait i took the liberty of stowing all my fish and fishing tackle on board of that handy little boat which i began to admire and long for more and more every time i jumped from the rock into her foresheets and finding how tight and crank she was and full of spring at every step and with a pair of good ash skulls and most of all discovering the snuggest of snug lockers my conscience always a foremost feature showed me in the strongest light that it would be a deeply ungracious ungrateful and even sinful thing if i failed to thank an ever wise and overruling providence for sending me this useful gift in so express a manner 
and taking this pious and humble view of the night's occurrence i soon perceived a special fitness in the time of its ordering for it happened to be the very night when evan thomas was out of the way as i had been told at nottage and the steward of the manor safe to be as drunk as a fiddler at bridge end and it was not more than a few months since that envious scotchman sandy macraw a scurvy limb of the coast guards who lived by poaching on my born rights had set himself up with a boat forsooth on purpose to rogue me and rob me the better no doubt he had stolen it somewhere for he first appeared at night with it and now here was a boat in all honesty mine which would travel two feet for each one of his tub by the time i had finished these grateful reflections and resolved to contribute any unsold crafts to the dissenting minister's salary in recognition of the hand of providence and what he had taught me concerning it no longer ago than last sabbath day when he said that the lord would make up to me for the loss of my poor wife though never dreaming i must confess of anything half so good as a boat and by the time that i had moored this special mercy snugly and hidden the oars so that no vile record could make off with her feloniously that dear little child was grown quiet again being unable to cry any more and now beginning to watch my doings as much as i could wish or more she never seemed tired of watching me having slept out all her sleep for the moment and as i piled up fish on fish and they came sliding slippery she came shyly eyeing them with a desire to see each one pushing her mites of fingers out and then drawing back in a hurry as their bellies shone in the moonlight some of the conjurers could wiggle still and they made her scream when they did it but the lobsters were her chief delight being all alive and kicking she came and touched them reverently and ready to run if they took it amiss and then she stroked their whiskers crying pity pity jolly jolly till one great fellow who knew no better would have nipped her wrist asunder if i had not ricked his claw now dearie said i as i drew her away you have brought poor old davy a beautiful boat and the least that he can do for you is to get you a good supper for since her tumble the little soul had seemed neither hungry nor thirsty please old davy she answered i ants to go to mamma and papa a nickel bother and susan the devil you do thought i in a whistle not seeing my way to a fib as yet does e know mamma and papa and ickle bother old davy to be sure i do my dearie better than i know you almost et me go to em et me go to em ah mamma say about my poor leggy peggy this was more than i could tell believing her mother to be no doubt some thirty fathoms under water and her father and little brother in about the same predicament come along my little dear and i'll take you to your mother this was what i said not being ready as yet with a corker i says ye old davy she answered i's kite yeddy and eel e be yeddy peshy boo ready and steady word of command march said i looking up at the moon to try to help me out of it but the only thing that i could find to help me in this trouble was to push about and stir and keep her looking at me she was never tired of looking at things with life or motion in them and this i found the special business of her nature afterwards now being sure of my boat i began to think what to do with bardie and many foolish ideas came but i saw no way to a wise one or at least i thought so then and unhappily looked to prudence more than to gracious providence for which i have often grieved bitterly ever since it turned out who bardie was for the present however though strongly smitten with her manners appearance and state of shipwreck as well as impressed with a general sense of her being meant for good luck to me i could not see my way to take her to my home and support her 
many and many times over i said to myself in my doubt and uneasiness and perhaps more times than need have been if my conscience had joined me that it was no good to be a fool to give way as a woman might do to the sudden affair of the moment and a hot-hearted mode of regarding it and the harder i worked at the stowing of fish the clearer my duty appeared to me so by the time that all was ready for starting with this boat of mine the sea being all the while as pretty as a pond by candlelight it was settled in my mind what to do with bardie she must go to the old scar house and having taken a special liking through the goodness of my nature and the late distress upon me to this little helpless thing most sincerely i prayed to god that all might be ordered for the best as indeed it always is if we leave it to him nevertheless i ought never to have left it to him as every one now acknowledges but how could i tell by this time she began to be overcome with circumstances as might happen naturally to a child but two years old after long exposure without any food or management scared and strange and tired out she fell down anyhow in the boat and lay like a log and frightened me many men would have cared no more but taking the baby for dead have dropped her into the grave of the waters i however have always been of a very different stamp from these and all the wars and discipline and doctrine i have encountered never could imbue me with the cruelty of my betters therefore i was shocked at thinking that the little dear was dead End of chapter five Chapter Six of the Maid of Skur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Six. Finds a home of some sort. However, it was high time now if we had any hope at all of getting into Skur House that night, to be up and moving. For though Evan Thomas might be late, Moxie his wife would be early, and the door would open to none but the master after the boys were gone to bed. For the house is very lonely, and people no longer innocent as they used to be in that neighbourhood. I found the child quite warm and nice, though overwhelmed with weight of sleep, and setting her crosswise on my shoulders, whence she slid down into my bosom, over the rocks I picked my way, by the light of the full clear moon, towards the old Skur Grange, which stands a little back from the ridge of beach and on the edge of the sand hills. This always was, and always must be, a very sad and lonesome place, close to a desolate waste of sand, and the continual roaring of the sea upon black rocks. A great grey house, with many chimneys, many gables, and many windows, yet not a neighbour to look out on, not a tree to feed its chimneys, scarce a firelight in its gables in the very depth of winter. Of course, it is said to be haunted, and though I believe not altogether in any stories of that kind, despite some very strange things indeed which I have beheld at sea, at any rate, I would rather not hear any yarns on that matter just before bedtime in that house, and most people would agree with me, unless I am much mistaken. For the whole neighbourhood, if so you may call it, where there are no neighbours, is a very queer one, stormy, wild, and desolate, with little more than rocks and sand and sea, to make one's choice among. As to the sea, not only dull and void it is of any haven or of proper traffic, but as dangerous as need be, even in good weather, being full of draughts and currents, with a tide like a mill race, suffering also the ups and downs, which must be where the Atlantic Ocean jostles with blind narrowings. It offers, moreover, a special peril a treacherous and a shifty one, in the shape of some horrible quicksands, known as the Skur Weathers. 
these at the will of storm and current change about from place to place but are for the most part some two miles from shore and from two to four miles long according to circumstances sometimes almost bare at half tide and sometimes covered at low water if any ship falls into them the bravest skipper that ever stood upon a quarter-deck can do no more than pipe to prayers though one or two craft have escaped when the tide was rising rapidly as for the shore it is no better when once you get beyond the rocks than a stretch of sand hills with a breadth of flaggy marsh behind them all the way to the mouth of neath river some three leagues to the westward eastward the scene is fairer inland but the coast itself more rugged and steep and scarcely more inhabited having no house nearer than richin's which is only a small farm nearly two miles from skirr grange and a mile from any other house and if you strike inland from skirr that is to say to the northward there is nothing to see but sand warren and firs and great fields marked with rubble even as far as kenvig looking at that vast lonely house there were two things i never could make out the first was who could ever have been mad enough to build it there for it must have cost a mint of money being all of quarried and carried stone and with no rich farm to require it and the second thing was still worse a puzzle how could any one ever live there as to the first point the story is that the house was built by abbots of neath when owners of skirr manor adding to it very likely as they followed one another and then it was used as their manor court and for purposes more important as a place of reflection being near good fisheries and especially kenvig pool stocked with all freshwater fish and every kind of wild fowl but upon the other question all i can say is this i have knocked about the world a good bit and have suffered many trials by the which i am no doubt chastened and highly rectified nevertheless i would rather end my life among the tombstones if only allowed three farthings worth of tobacco every day than live with all those abbots luxuries in that old grey house however there were no abbots now nor any sort of luxury only a rough unpleasant farmer a kind but slovenly wife of his and five great lads notorious for pleasing no one except themselves also a boy of a different order as you soon shall see thinking of all this i looked with tenderness at the little deer fallen back so fast asleep innocent and trustful with her head upon my shoulder and her breathing in my beard turning away at view of the house i brought the moonlight on her face and this appeared so pure and calm and fit for better company that a pain went to my heart as in welsh we speak of it because she was so fast asleep and that alone is something holy in a very little child so much it seems to be the shadow of the death itself in their pausing fluttering lives in their want of wit for dreaming and their fitness for a world of which they must know more than this also to a man who feels the loss of much believing and what grievous gain it is to make doubt of everything such a simple trust in him than whom we find no better father such a confidence of safety at the very outset seems a happy art unknown and tempts him back to ignorance well aware what years must bring from all the ill they have brought to us we cannot watch this simple sort without a sadness on our side a pity and a longing as for something lost and gone in the scoop between two sand-hills such a power of moonlight fell upon the face of this baby that it only wanted the accident of her lifting bright eyes to me to make me cast away all prudence and even the dread of bunny but a man at my time of life must really look to the main chance first and scout all romantic visions 
and another face means another mouth, however pretty it may be. Moreover, I had no wife now, nor woman to look after us, and what can even a man-child do without their apparatus? While on the other hand I knew that, however dreary Skur might be, there was one motherly heart inside it. Therefore it came to pass that soon the shadow of that dark house fell upon the little one in my arms, while with a rotten piece of timber, which was lying handy, I thumped and thumped at the old oak door. But nobody came to answer me, nobody even seemed to hear, though every knock went further and further into the emptiness of the place. But just as I had made up my mind to lift the latch and to walk in freely, as I would have done in most other houses, but stood upon scruple with Evan Thomas, I heard a slow step in the distance, and Moxy Thomas appeared at last, a kindly-hearted and pleasant woman, but apt to be low-spirited, as was natural for Evan's wife, and not very much of a manager. And yet it seems hard to blame her there, when I come to think of it, for most of the women are but so, round about our neighbourhood, sanding up of room and passage, and forming patterns on the floor every other Saturday, and yet the roof all frayed with cobwebs, and the corners such as, in the navy, we should have been rope-ended for. By means of nature, Moxy was shaped for a thoroughly good and lively woman, and such no doubt she would have been, if she had had the luck to marry me, as at one time was our signification. God, however, ordered things in a different manner, and no doubt he was considering what might be most for my benefit. Nevertheless, in the ancient days, when I was a fine young tar on leave, and all Sunday schools set caps at me, perhaps I was two and twenty then, the only girl I would allow to sit on the crossing of my legs, upon a well-dusted tombstone, and suck the things I carried for them, all being fond of peppermint, was this little boxy straddling of good newton family and twelve years old at that time she made me swear on the blade of my knife never to have any one but her and really i looked forward to it as almost beyond a joke and her father had some money who's there at this time of night cried moxy thomas sharply and in welsh of course though she had some english pull the latch if you be honest Evan Black is in the house. By the tone of her voice I knew that this last was a fib of fright, and glad I was to know it so. Much the better chance was left me of disposing Bardy somewhere where she might be comfortable. Soon as Mrs. Thomas saw us by the light of a homemade dip, she scarcely stopped to stare before she wanted the child out of my arms, and was ready to devour it, guessing that it came from sea and talking all the while, full gallop, as women find the way to do. I was expecting fifty questions, and no doubt she asked them, yet seemed to answer them all herself, and be vexed with me for talking, yet to want me to go on. Moxie now, be quick, I said, this little thing from out the sea. Quick is it? Quick indeed? Much quick you are, old Dio, she replied in English the darling dear the pretty love for the child had spread its hands to her being taken with a woman's dress give her to me clumsy davy is that the way you do carry her old oh, davy tarry me nay nicely i tell her old oh, davy good and kind and i won't have him called clumsy so spake up my two-year-old astonishing me as she always has done by her wonderful cleverness and surprising Moxie Thomas that such clear good words should come from so small a creature. "'My goodness me, you little vixen, wherever did you come from? Bring her in yourself, then, Dio, if she thinks so much of you. Let me feel her. Not wet, is she? Wherever did you get her? Put her on this little stool, and let her warm them mites of feet till I go for bread and butter.' Although the weather was so hot, a fire of coal and driftwood was burning in the great chimney-piece for cooking of black evan's supper because he was an outrageous man to eat whenever he was drunk which 
as a doctor told me once shows the finest of all constitutions but truly there was nothing else of life or cheer or comfort in the great sad stony room a floor of stone six gloomy doorways and a black beamed ceiling no wonder that my little darling cowered back into my arms and put both hands before her eyes no 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 she said body doesn't like it when mamma come she'd be very angry with a old davy i felt myself bound to do exactly as mrs thomas ordered me and so i carried miss finical to the three-legged stool of firwood which had been pointed out to me and having a crick in my back for a moment after bearing her so far down i set her upon her own legs which though so neat and pretty were uncommonly steadfast to my astonishment off she started before i could fetch myself to think over the rough stone flags of the hall trotting on her toes entirely for the very life of her before i could guess what she was up to she had pounced upon an old kitchen towel newly washed but full of splinters hanging on a three-legged horse and back she ran in triumph with it for none could say that she toddled and with a want of breath and yet a vigour that made up for it began to rub with all her power as well as a highly skilful turn the top of that blessed three-legged stool and some way down the sides of it what's the matter my dear i asked almost losing my mind at this after all her other wonders dirt she replied degustin dirt never stopping to look up at me what odds for a little dirt when a little soul is hungry Bardy a boofly keen gal and this too disgusting coachung was all the reply she vouchsafed me but i saw that she thought less of me however i was glad enough that moxy did not hear her for mrs thomas had no unreasonable ill will towards dirt but rather liked it in its place and with her its place was everywhere but i being used to see every cranny searched and scoured with holy stone blessed moreover when ashore with a wife like amphitrite who used to come aboard of us could thoroughly enter into the cleanliness of this body and thought more of her accordingly while this little trot was working in the purest ignorance of father and of mother yet perhaps in her tiny mind hoping to have pleased them both back came mrs thomas bringing all the best she had of comfort and of cheer for us though not much to speak of i took a little hollands hot on purpose to oblige her because she had no rum and the little baby had some milk and rabbit gravy being set up in a blanket and made the most we could make of her and she ate a truly beautiful supper sitting gravely on the stool and putting both hands to her mouth in fear of losing anything all the boys were gone to bed after a long day's rabbiting and evan black still on the spree so that i was very pleasant knowing my boat to be quite safe toward my ancient sweetheart and we got upon the old times so much in a pleasing innocent teasing way that but for fear of that vile black evan we might have forgotten poor bardy end of chapter 6「Seven of the Maid of Skur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 7. Boat versus Bardy. Glad as I was for the poor child's sake, that black evan happened to be from home i had perhaps some reason also to rejoice on my own account for if anything of any kind could ever be foretold about that most uncertain fellow's conduct it was that when in his cups he would fight with cause if he could find any otherwise without it and in the present case perhaps was some little cause for fighting touching as he no doubt would think 
not only his marital but manorial rights of plunder of course between moxy and myself all was purely harmless each being thankful to have no more than a pleasant eye for the other and of course in really serious ways i had done no harm to him that boat never being his except by downright piracy nevertheless few men there are who look at things from what i may call a large and open standing place and evan might even go so far as to think that i did him a double wrong in taking that which was his the boat and leaving that which should have been mine to wit the little maiden as a helpless burden upon his hands without so much as a change of clothes and all this after a great day's sport among his rocks without his permission feeling how hopeless it would be to reason these matters out with him especially as he was sure to be drunk i was glad enough to say good night to my new young pet now fast asleep and to slip off quietly to sea with my little frigate and its freight indulging also my natural pride at being for the first time in my life a legitimate ship-owner and independent deep-sea fisherman by this time the tide was turned of course and running strong against me as i laid her head for newton bay by the light of the full moon and proud i was without mistake to find how fast i could send my little crank barky against the current having been a fine oarsman in my day and always stroke of the captain's gig but as one who was well acquainted with the great dearth of honesty not in our own parish only but for many miles around i could not see my way to the public ownership of this boat without a deal of trouble and vexation happening so that i did not buy it being thoroughly void of money which was too notorious especially after two funerals conducted to everybody's satisfaction big rogues would declare at once judging me by themselves perhaps that i had been and stolen it and likely enough to the back of this they would lay me half a dozen murders and a wholesale piracy now i have by nature the very strongest affection for truth that can be reconciled with a good man's love of reason but sometimes it happens so that we must do violence to ourselves for the sake of our fellow-creatures if these upon occasion offered are only too sure to turn away and reject the truth with a strong disgust surely it is dead against the high and pure duty we owe them to saddle them with such a heavy and deep responsibility and to take still loftier views of the charity and kindness needful towards our fellow beings when they hanker for a thing as they do nearly always for a lie and have set their hearts upon it how selfish it must be and inhuman not to let them have it otherwise like a female in a delicate condition to what extent of injury may we not expose them now sailors have a way of telling great facts of imagination in the most straightforward and simple manner being so convinced themselves that they care not a rope's end who besides is convinced and who is not and to make other people believe the way is not to want them to do it only the man must himself believe and be above all reasoning and i was beginning to believe more and more as i went on and the importance of it grew clearer all about that ill-fated ship of which i had been thinking ever since the boat came in twelve years ago as nearly as need be and in the height of summer namely on the third of june seventeen seventy a large ship called the planters velvard bound from surinam to the port of amsterdam had been lost and swallowed up near this very dangerous place three poor children of the planter whose name was j s jackart on their way home to be educated had floated ashore or at least their bodies and are now in newton churchyard the same must have been the fate of bardie but for the accident of that boat and though she was not a dutchman's child so far as one could guess from her wonderful power of english and no sign of dutch build about her she might very well have been in a dutch ship with her father and mother 
and little brother and susan in the best cabin it was well known among us that dutch vessels lay generally northward of their true course and from the likeness of the soundings often came up the bristol instead of the english channel and that this mistake which the set of the stream would increase generally proved fatal to them in the absence of any lighthouse that some ship or other had been lost was to my mind out of all dispute although the weather had been so lovely but why it must have been a dutch rather than an english ship and why i need so very plainly to have seen the whole of it myself as by this time i began to believe that i had done is almost more than i can tell except that i hoped it might be so as giving me more thorough warrant in the possession of my prize this boat moreover seemed to be of foreign build so far as i could judge of it by moonlight but of that hereafter the wonder is that i could judge of anything at all i think after the long and hard day's work for a man not so young as he used to be and rocks are most confusing things to be among for a length of time and away from one's fellow creatures and nothing substantial on the stomach they do so darken and jag and quiver and hang over heavily as a man wanders under them with never a man to speak to and then the sands have such a way of shaking and of shivering and changing colour beneath the foot and shining in and out with patterns coming all astray to you when to these contrary vagaries you begin to add the loose unprincipled curve of waves and the up and down of light around you and to and fro of sea breezes and startling noise of sea fowl and a world of other confusions with roar of the deep confounding them it becomes a bitter point to judge a man of what he saw and what he thinks he must have seen it is beneath me to go on with what might seem excuses enough that i felt myself in the right and what more can any man do if you please however perfect he may be therefore i stowed away my boat well earned both by mind and body snugly enough to defy for the present even the sharp eyes of sandy mccraw under newton point where no one ever went but myself some of my fish i put to freshen in a solid mass of bladder weed and some i took home for the morning and a stroke of business after church and if any man in the world deserved a downright piece of good rest that night with weary limbs and soft conscience you will own it was davy llewellyn sunday morning i lay abed with bunny tugging very hard to get me up for breakfast until it was almost eight o'clock and my grandchild in a bitter strait of hunger for the things she smelled after satisfying her and scoring at the jolly sailors three fine bass against my shot what did i do but go to church with all my topmost togs on and that not from respect alone for the parson who was a customer nor even that colonel locker of candleston court might see me and feel inclined to discharge me as an exemplary churchman when next brought up before him these things weighed with me a little it is useless to deny but my main desire was that the parish should see me there and know that i was not abroad on a longshore expedition but was ready to hold up my head on a sunday with the best of them as i always had done at one time while i ate my breakfast i had some idea perhaps that it would be more pious almost and create a stronger belief in me as well as ease my own penitence with more relief of groaning if i were to appear in the chapel of the primitive christians after certain fish were gutted but partly the fear of their singing noise unsuitable to my head that morning after the hollands at skirr house and partly my sense that after all it was but forecastle work there while the church was quarter-deck and most of all the circumstance that no magistrate ever went there led me on the whole to give the preference to the old concern supported so bravely by royalty accordingly to church i went and did a tidy stroke of business both before and after service in the way of lobsters 
we made a beautiful dinner that day bunny and i and mother jones who was good enough to join us and after slipping down to see how my boat lay for the tide and finding her as right as could be it came into my head that haply it would be a nice attention as well as ease my mind upon some things that were running in it if only i could pluck up spirit to defy the heat of the day and challenge my own weariness by walking over to skir manor for of course the whole of monday and perhaps of tuesday too and even some part of wednesday with people not too particular must be occupied in selling my great catch of saturday so i resolved to go and see how the little visitor was getting on and to talk with her for though in her weariness and wandering of the night before she did not seem to remember much as was natural at her tender age who could tell what might have come to her memory by this time especially as she was so clever and it might be a somewhat awkward thing if the adventures which i felt really must have befallen her should happen to be contradicted by her own remembrance for all i wanted was the truth and if her truths contradicted mine why mine must be squared off to meet them for great is truth and shall prevail i thought it as well to take bunny with me for children have a remarkable knack of talking to one another which they will not use to grown people also the walk across the sands is an excellent thing for young legs we say being apt to crack the skin a little and so enabling them to grow a strong and hearty child was bunny fit to be rated a b almost as behoved a fine sailor's daughter and as proud as you could wish to see and never willing to give in so i promised myself some little sport in watching our bunny's weariness as the sand grew deeper and yet her pride to the last declaring that i should not carry her but here i reckoned quite amiss for the power of the heat was such being the very hottest day i ever knew out of the tropics and the great ridge of sand hills shutting us off from any sight of the water that my little grandchild scarcely plodded a mile ere i had to carry her and this was such a heavy job among the deep dry mounds of sand that for a time i repented much of the over caution which had stopped me from using my beautiful new boat at once to paddle down with the ebb to skir and come home gently afterwards with the flow of the tide towards evening nevertheless as matters proved it was wiser to risk the broiling this heat was not of the sun alone such as we get any summer's day and such as we had yesterday but thickened heat from the clouds themselves shedding it down like a burning glass and weltering all over us it was though i scarcely knew it then the summing up and crowning period of whole weeks of heat and drought and indeed of the hottest summer known for at least a generation and in the hollows of yellow sand without a breath of air to stir or a drop of moisture or a firm place for the foot but a red and fiery haze to go through it was all a man could do to keep himself from staggering hence it was close upon three o'clock by the place the sun was in when bunny and i came in sight of skir house and hoped to find some water there beer of course i would rather have but never was there a chance of that within reach of evan thomas and i tried to think this all the better for half a gallon would not have gone any distance with me after ploughing so long through sand with the heavy weight of bunny upon a day like that only i hoped that my dear little grandchild might find something fit for her and such as to set her up again for never before had i seen her high and strong as her spirit was so overcome by the power and pressure of the air above us she lay in my arms almost as helpless as little bardie three years younger had lain the night before and knowing how children will go off without a man's expecting it i was very uneasy though aware of her constitution so in the heat i chirped and whistled though ready to drop myself almost and coming in sight of the house i tried my best to set her up again finding half of her clothes gone down her back and a great part of her fat legs somehow sinking into her sunday shoes 
End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Maid of Skur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 8 Children Will Be Children. The boys of Skur, as we always call those rough fellows over at Newton, were rabbiting in the warren, according to their usual practice on a Sunday afternoon. A loose, unseemly lot of lads, from fifteen up to two and twenty years of age, perhaps, and very little to choose between them as to work and character. All, however, were known to be first-rate hands at any kind of sporting, or of poaching, or of any roving pleasure. Watkin, the sixth and youngest boy, was of a different nature. His brothers always cast him off, and treated him with a high contempt, yet never could despise him. In their rough way, they could hardly help a sulky sort of love for him. The seventh and last child had been a girl, a sweet little creature as could be seen, and taking after Watkin. But she had something on her throat, from six months up to six years old and when she died, some three months back, people who had been in the house said that her mother would sooner have lost all the boys put together, if you left Watkin out of them. How that was I cannot say, and preferred to avoid those subjects, but I know that poor Black Evan swore no oath worth speaking of for one great market and two small ones, but seemed brought down to sit by himself, drinking quietly, all day long. When we came to the ancient hall, or kitchen as they now called it, for a moment I was vexed, expecting more of a rush perhaps than I was entitled to. Knowing how much that young child owed me for her preservation, and feeling how fond I was of her, what did I look for but wild delight at seeing old Davy back again? However, it seems she had taken up with another and forgotten me. Watkin, the youngest boy of Skur, was an innocent, good little fellow, about twelve years old at that time. Bardy had found this out already, as quickly as she found out my goodness, even by the moonlight. She had taken the lead upon Watkin, and was laying down the law to him, upon a question of deep importance, about the manner of dancing. I could dance a hornpipe with anybody, and forward I came to listen, no, no, I tell her. He mustn't do like that, Yatkin. He must go yond and yond like this, and he must hold her clothes out, same as I does. God he lay. He must hold her clothes out all the time, he must. The little atom, all the time she delivered these injunctions, was holding out her tiny frock in the daintiest manner, and tripping sideways here and there, and turning round quite upon tiptoe, with her childish figure poised, and her chin thrown forward, and then she would give a good hard jump, but all to the tune of the brass Jew's harp, which the boy was playing for his very life. And all the while she was doing this, the amount of energy and expression in her face was wonderful. You would have thought there was nothing else in all the world that required doing with such zeal and abandonment. Presently the boy stopped for a moment, and she came and took the knee of his trousers, and put it to her pretty lips with the most ardent gratitude. She must be a foreigner, said I to myself. No British child could dance like that, and talk so, and no British child ever shows gratitude. As they had not espied us yet, where we stood in the passage corner, I drew Bunny backward, and found her all of a tremble with eagerness to go and help. More pay! said little Missy, with a coaxing look. More pay, Yatkin! No, no, you must say more play, please, Watkin. See you pay, Yatkin, I ain't more pay. The funny thing laughed at herself while saying it, as if with some comic inner sense of her own insatiability in the matter of play. But how do you expect me to play the music? 
asked Watkin, very reasonably, if I am to hold my clothes out all the time. Can I? she replied, looking up at him with the deepest disappointment. Can't I play and dance too, Yakin? I thought I could do anything. I wants to go to my dear mamma and papa and it could bother. Here she began to set up a very lamentable cry, and Watkin in vain tried to comfort her till, hearing us, she broke from him. There's my dear mamma! There's my dear mamma coming! she exclaimed as she trotted full speed to the door. Mamma, mamma, here I is! And he mustn't scold poor Susan. It is out of my power to describe how a little flushed countenance fell when she saw only me and Bunny. She drew back suddenly, with the brightness fading out of her eager eyes, and the tears that were in them began to roll, and her bits of hands went up to her forehead, as if she had lost herself, and the corners of her mouth came down, and then with a sob she turned away, and with quivering shoulders hid herself. I scarcely knew what to do for the best, but our bunny was very good to her, even better than could have been hoped, although she came of a kindly race. Without standing upon ceremony, as many children would have done, up she ran to the motherless stranger, and kneeling down on the floor, contrived to make her turn and look at her. Then Bunny pulled out her new handkerchief, of which she was proud, I can tell you, being the first she had ever owned made from the soundest corner of Mother Joan's old window-blind, and only allowed with a Sunday frock. And although she had too much respect for this to wet it with anything herself, she never for a moment grudged to wipe poor Bardie's eyes with it. Nay, she even permitted her, which was much more for a child to do, to take it into her own two hands and rub away at her eyes with it. Gradually she coaxed her out of the cupboard of her refuge, and sitting in some posture known to none but women children, without a stool to help her, she got the little one on her lap, and stroked at her, and murmured to her, as if she had found a favourite doll in the depth of trouble. Upon the whole, I was so pleased that I vowed to myself I would give my bunny the very brightest halfpenny I should earn upon the morrow. Meanwhile, the baby of higher birth, as a glance was enough to show her, began to relax and come down a little, both from her dignity and her woe. She looked at Bunny with a gleam of humour, to which her wet eyes gave effect. He call at a ponky handkerchief. Does a call at a ponky handkerchief? Bunny was so overpowered by this, after all she had done and that the air of pity wherewith her proud ornament was flung on the floor, that she could only look at me as if I had cheated her about it. And truly, I had seen no need to tell her about Mother Jones and her blind. Then these little ones got up, having sense of a natural discordance of rank between them, and Bunny no longer wiped the eyes of Bardy, nor Bardy wept in the arms of Bunny. They put their little hands behind them, and stood apart to think a bit, and watched each other shyly. To see them move their mouths and fingers, and peep from the corners of their eyes, was as good as almost any play without a hornpipe in it. It made no difference, however. Very soon they came to settle it between them. The low-born bunny looked down upon Bardy for being so much smaller, and the high-born Bardy looked down upon Bunny for being so much coarser but neither was able to tell the other at all what her opinion was, and so, without any further trouble, they became very excellent playmates. Doing my best to make them friends, I seized the little stranger and gave her several good toss-ups, as well as tickles between them, and this was more than she could resist, being, as her nature shows, thoroughly fond of any kind of pleasure and amusement. She laughed, and she flung out her arms, and every time she made such jumps as to go up like a feather. Pretty soon I saw, however, that this had gone on too long for Bunny. She put her poor handkerchief out of sight, and then some fingers into her mouth, and she looked as black as a dog in a kennel. But Bardie showed good nature now, for she ran up to Bunny, and took her hand, 
and led her to me and said very nicely give this ickle girl some dough davy she hasn't had no pay at all oh hot boofly buckins you got oh jolly jolly keel song grand this admiration of my buttons which truly were very handsome being on my regulation coat and as good as gilt almost with minotaur a kind of grampus as they say done round them this appreciation of the navy made me more and more perceive what a dear child was come ashore to us and that we ought to look alive to make something out of her if she had any friends remaining and they could scarcely have all been drowned being as she clearly was of a high and therefore rich family it might be worth ten times as much as even my boat had been to me to keep her safe and restore her in a fat state when demanded with that i made up my mind to take her home with me that very night especially as bunny seemed to have set up a wonderful fancy to her but man sees single god sees double as our saying is and her bits of french made me afraid that she might after all be a beggar now go and play like two little dears and remember whose day it is i said to them both for i felt the duty of keeping my grandchild up to the mark on all religious questions and be sure you don't go near the well nor out of sight of the house at all nor pull the tails of the chickens out nor throw stones at the piggy wiggy for i knew what bunny's tricks were and now what it my boy come and talk to me and perhaps i will give you a june eating apple from my own tree under the clevis although the heat was tremendous now even inside those three feet walls the little things did as i bade them and i made the most of this occasion to have a talk with watkin who told me everything he knew his mother had not been down since dinner which they always got anyhow because his father who had been poorly for some days and feverish and forced to lie in bed a little came to the top of the stairs and called requiring some attendance what this meant i knew as well as if i had seen black evan there parched with thirst and with great eyes rolling after helpless drunkenness and roaring with his night-clothes on for a quart of fresh-drawn ale but about the shipwrecked child what he knew scarce anything he had found her in his bed that morning moxie no doubt having been hard pushed with her husband in that state what to do and knowing how kind young what he was she had quartered the baby upon him but watkin though gifted with pretty good english or sassenach as we call it beyond all the rest of his family could not follow the little creature in her manner of talking which indeed as i found thereafter nobody in the parish could do except myself and an englishwoman whose word was not worth taking indeed and indeed then mr llewellyn he went on in english having an evident desire to improve himself by discourse with me i did try and i did try and my mother she tried too times and times for sure we tried but no use was the whole of it she only shakes her head and thinks with all her might as you may say and then she says no i says not hot she says i's two years old and i's bardy and my papa he be very angry if he goes on so with me my mamma yoves me and i yove her and papa and ickle bother and everybody but not the naughty bad man i doesn't that isn't true english now i don't think is it then mr llewellyn certainly not i answered seeing that my character for good english was at stake and mother says she knows well enough the baby must be a foreigner on her dress it is to show it no name as the christians put but marks without any meaning and of clothes so few upon her till mother go to the old cupboard rich people mother do say they must be but dead by this time she make no doubt boy i replied your mother i fear is right in that particular to me it is a subject of anxiety and sorrow and i know perhaps more about it than any one else can pretend to do the boy looked at me with wonder and eagerness about it but i gave him a look as much as to say ask no more at present however he was so full of her 
that he could not keep from talking. We asked who the naughty bad man was, but she was afraid at that, and went all round the room with her eyes, and hid under mother's apron. How dreadful she cried at breakfast about her mamma and her own spoon. To my heart I feel a pain when she does cry, I know I do, and then of a sudden she is laughing, and no reason for it. I never did see such a baby before. Do you think so, Mr. Llewellyn? End of chapter 8